Coming up on DTNS, Epic versus Apple begins Monday. What you need to know in advance, plus a robot street sweeper and an air traffic control tower with no humans in it. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 30th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And the visiting closer of Fridays, big Chris Ashley hanging out with my peoples. Draw on the top tech, tech stories from Cleveland. I'm Lynn Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chan. We were talking a lot about ice cream and root vegetables on Good Day Internet. If you would like that wider conversation, become a member. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google announced new policies and guidelines for apps are coming to its Play Store later this year. Screenshots and videos that demonstrate an app's features and functionality will need to follow new rules to accurately represent those apps and games starting in the second half of 2021. And new rules for details in app titles, icons, and descriptions will start to be enforced later this year. Words in all caps, for example, no longer allowed unless that's the specific brand name, nor will emoji be allowed in titles, and action prompts like download now or sale icon banners also banned. A couple more earnings reports to note. Twitter added 7 million monetizable daily active users between Q4 and Q1 for a total of 199 million, just missing expectations of 200. Uh, it also grew revenue 32% on the year. Twitter now makes $899 million. Amazon, on the other hand, trounced expectations, growing its sales 44% on the year. AWS sales alone grew 32%, and its other category, which is where Amazon's advertising is, grew 77%. The European Commission charged Apple with antitrust violations, saying that Apple abused its market position by making music streaming apps use its in-app payment system and distorted competition by limiting how developers could inform users of cheaper ways to subscribe outside the app. The case stems from an antitrust complaint filed by Spotify back in March of 2019. Automakers are announcing more changes in response to the global chip shortage that they now believe will last beyond the spring. Ford said Wednesday it will cut second quarter production in half. It does expect the situation to improve after June. Volkswagen said it will halt production of the Jetta in Mexico from May 3rd to May 20th, and production of the Tiguan will pause from May 6th to May 17th. Daimler's Mercedes-Benz temporarily halted its production at two plants in Germany, and a drought in Taiwan continues, threatening to disrupt chip production there. The Wall Street Journal sources say China's central bank and four other regulatory agencies told tech companies Thursday that they must no longer provide financial services beyond payments. The regulators told Tencent, which operates WeChat, ride-hailing company DD Shuxing, and e-commerce platform JD.com, and 10 other companies that bundle services like loans and interest earning deposit accounts into their apps are creating risks for China's broader financial system. Ant Group is already delinking financial services from Alipay and reorganizing as a financial services company. All right, we got that Epic Apple fight to talk about in a minute, but we have another fight brewing we should talk about. We mentioned it on Monday, and now it's for real. The YouTube TV app no longer available for download in the Roku channel store. Roku and Google could not reach an agreement on terms. Existing YouTube TV customers can still use the app. They're not pulling it if you're an existing customer. Just new customers won't be able to get it. Platforms like Roku often make special agreements with larger app makers on things like ad revenue sharing, app placement, promotion, etc. That's what these disputes are always about. Roku said that this one isn't about money. YouTube wanted access to customer data it wasn't willing to share and wanted YouTube to agree to hardware requirements for the YouTube TV app to work and limit search results to just YouTube results when the YouTube app is open. Roku itself also wants to lower the priority of a dedicated row of search results for YouTube that shows up in Roku's general search. Roku says it's not gonna ask for more money, it just doesn't want to agree to the other terms. Google said in a statement, quote, to be clear, we have never, as they have alleged, made any request to access user data or interfere with search results. This claim is baseless and false. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, Google. Um, sorry if I woke up anybody's smart assistant just then. Uh -huh. So everybody loses, right? Uh, Yes. Google well, yes. wants YouTube TV to be available on the Roku platform. A lot of people have Roku devices. 
People who have Roku devices want to be able to access an extremely popular cord cutting television option. And then if you're the customer, well, okay, if you already have YouTube TV on your Roku uh, device, then you're good to go, but nobody new can get that. And Roku devices, some of them anyway, are nice and cheap and that very attractive option for folks. So it's, yeah, this is just messy stuff. Yeah, this is a crazy uh, kind of funny scenario. You'll have to forgive the beeping. I'm having a power outage right now. So oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on batteries right now. But um, it, it's kind of a funny situation because it's like, who do you believe in this scenario? Um, you know, Roku's definitely putting out some statements against Google. Google's definitely uh, denying those. And uh, and the, the other funny part is, how is this happening in what's supposed to be our savior, which is a streaming service? This used to happen with DirecTV all the time with the different uh, networks, and now it's happening on streaming services. This is crazy. Yeah. It, it turns out that uh, companies that make agreements can still fight even in the streaming world, right? Uh, unfortunately, it didn't It didn't fix that. And I, I think the reason it has, seems to happen with Roku more often, uh, you don't see Apple TV get in, into these these disputes hardly ever. You, you've seen Amazon get in a couple of them, but not as often. Is because Roku has less leverage. You know, Roku's going it alone out there. Their entire business is made up in the platform of Roku OS and selling hardware that runs Roku OS. And so they need to push harder because Apple can make an agreement with Google on 15 different things all at once uh, and, and do some more horse trading there. So can Amazon. Roku can't do that. So I, I think that's why you see Roku always holding a little bit of a harder line because not only do they want to get the best deal out of YouTube in this case, but they also don't want to set a precedent for other big companies to come in and start saying, well, we also want to get what that company got. Yeah, I can see. I, I can see where Roku's like, listen, we, we let YouTube TV, um, and, you know, YouTube in general be as present as, you know, let's just say that all the things that Google says are baseless are not baseless just for the sake of argument. You know, if Roku, if Roku allows that, then all of a sudden it's like YouTube all over the place. And yeah, what, what, what happens when the next company is like, well, hold on a second. That doesn't seem very fair. We want a lot of, uh, extra specials too. And I can't really think of who besides Google would be that company, but you know, it, it'll happen eventually. So yeah. I, I see where Peacock Roku's in a, or Disney or somebody like that. Yeah. Right? I see where Roku's in a tough spot where it's like, this is a precedent, you know, they gotta, they gotta take a stance one way or another. But if it were me and I was about to sign up for a service and, and, and perhaps buy a device that had a platform like Roku's, I would be very miffed about this whole thing. These things one usually thing go way it. fast too. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. The one thing I'll say, though, is I'm glad if Google is being egregious, I'm glad Roku is at least standing up. You know, you're starting to see this a lot more, you know, with Spotify and Apple. And, you know, if if and it, there's no reason for me not to believe that Google is not trying to put pressure to get information that they want, you know, for search and all that. So, um, yeah, so I'm glad the little guys kind of standing up for themselves in, in the end. This is a negotiation that didn't didn't get resolved, so they're they're taking it into public, which you know has pre has precedent. People do that, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it's it, it means the a failure of negotiation when that happens. Uh, they're always going to point at each other about who's who's to blame. All right, tell us about what's going on uh, with the Apple Air Tags, Chris. There's a there's a little controversy brewing around those too. All right, so do me a favor, read that one for me, and then I'll comment on it. Okay, Fast Company reported concerns by the National Network to End Domestic Violence, the NNEDV, that Apple's AirTags could be used to track people by secretly slipping them into a bag or a jacket pocket. The idea being, uh, you know, a spouse that doesn't trust the other spouse uh, plants one of these AirTags without their knowledge and then is able to you know, track them around. Apple told 9to5Mac that if you arrive at your home address with an unknown AirTag, one that's not paired to your iPhone, it will alert you on your iPhone. Like, hey, you've got this thing on you. I mean, partly in case you accidentally have somebody's property, but also works in this case. It will also alert you if you're at a frequently visited location, usually a workplace or someplace like that. However, if you're an Android user, that's not gonna help you. Uh, AirTags do issue an audible alert if they're away from their paired iPhone for three days, 
But that's not going to help in all situations. You're going to have people who live with the person who secretly slipped the air tag onto them, and then that's going to make it near the paired iPhone. And similar issues do exist for other tracking tags like Tile, uh, but Tile works with Android and Windows, uh, and it works a little differently. So it's it's not exactly the same issue. So the the thing, and, and I I understand that the capability to track anybody, it's like mm, yeah, that 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 gets problematic quickly, but. Apple saying, all right, listen, if you've got an unknown air tag that's on your person or traveling with you, you don't know about it, you will get an alert where, yeah, you either are home because it knows where your home address is or somewhere that is, is you're going to often enough like a workplace. But, okay, let's say Chris and I are in a car together and he has an air tag and I have an air tag. It's like, okay, and we're, I don't know, we're like doing errands all day. So we're, we're with each other, right? Uh, that would be an air tag that the company might notice is with me for an extended period of time. But it's not a bad thing that it's with me because if I get an alert, I'm like, yeah, it's Chris's air tag. It's not a big deal. Right. But I mean, if somebody was tracking you and you're not at home and you're not at work, isn't that sort of the point of tracking you? So if you do get some an unknown air tag that becomes, you know, in your pocket or in your messenger bag or whatever, it's like, well, you don't have to go home for somebody who's spying on you to know where you are. Yeah, the one that, that I like the provisions that they're putting in there, like, um, you know, if you get close to your house and you have this unknown air tag, it'll alert you. But, you know, certainly the situation you just laid out could still trigger that. And I think overall, you know, when you have new technology like this and uh, it, you're going to run into the nefarious issues and then the, the issues that solve those problems, because, you know, the same things that they'll put in place to help prevent people from, you know, tr unwittingly or, you know, secretly being tracked is the same things that's going to prevent you from finding your device when somebody steals it, right? They're going to just, oh, this, now I got this alert that is tracking me. Let me turn off the tracking on this device. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, but I, I like the fact that, uh, you know, people are coming out with these things because I certainly want to err on the side of safety. But, yeah. uh, yeah, I just don't want it to stifle this type of technology. Well, I, I think the biggest the biggest part about this, and maybe this is, uh, I don't want to speak for the NNEDV, but maybe this is part of them uh, making a big deal about this, is awareness that this could happen is is one of the things that's important. If you, if you are a target of domestic abuse, you want to be aware that like, oh, they might try to slip an air tag in my pocket. I use an Android phone, they use an iPhone. Uh, so I, I want to be extra careful that nothing got slipped in my pockets, nothing got slipped in my handbag, uh, et cetera. And you know, that's not a perfect defense. I'm not trying to say it is, but at least if you know that that's a possibility, it's another thing you can be on the lookout for. That is a hundred percent. Yeah. You know, making sure people know that this is happening so that they can protect themselves as well. Yep. Well, for the month of April, the month that's wrapping up now, Helsinki, Finland has been trialing an autonomous robot street cleaner called Trombia Free, running it on a busy street and bicycle areas in the city. Because it runs pretty quietly, it can clean streets at night when traffic is lower and minimal disturbance to neighbors. Trombia Free can detect pedestrians. It can also detect other obstacles in its path and stop. Operators accompany the robot during the pilot test, so the robot wasn't completely autonomous, but that's the idea. Uh, they were there as a safety and also just to monitor noise level and cleaning efficiency, make sure everything was working as as uh, as expected, the makers of Trombia Free said it consumes 50 percent, 15 rather percent of the energy and a fraction of the water of a conventional street sweeper, and generates zero emissions. Espoo Finland is also trialed the Trombia Free, so I don't know. It's pretty cool. It's a it's a it looks like a Tesla, but it's huge because it's a street cleaner. If anybody sees a street sweeper, they're not small. Uh, this thing is the the size the size of a street sweeper, uh, and it just kind of trundles along. Uh, the video, I, I think they missed an opportunity in the demo video that's included on the next web article that we saw. Uh, it doesn't show any dirt in front of it. They should have really dirtied up that bike path they had it on. Yeah, show uh, us that see. that thing is working at least. Yeah, Man. take take yeah. a page from the vacuum salesman. Is it is I, it too late to start calling that thing the street Roomba and you know much like we call <laughs> paper towel all paper towels bounty yeah. and so on and so forth. Not at all. <laughs> Do Not you all. call all paper towels bounty? Oh. Yeah. You know, or Xerox, or yeah, whatever. Or Kleenex. Whatever, yeah. yeah, yeah. All of that. Yeah, stuff. the same idea. Although I will say in the video and and yeah, it was it it didn't didn't really show you all that much about how great of a cleaning, you know, cleaning machine it is, but it is big. And 
I know that the the uh, the trial was run in a well trafficked area of the city, in particular a really busy street. So running it at night where there are fewer obstructions to be had, but still it's going to happen every once in a while. It doesn't go very fast, and I wonder if that's because it's trying to clean a lot better, but also it's it, you know it's if you were to dart out in front of one of these things, it's not going fast enough to create, you know, these T-bone situations, I would say most of the time. The real test is put that thing in a parking lot and let's see if it just keeps bouncing back and forth between the parking divider and a tree or something. Like a Roomba? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> he really wants it to be a Roomba experience. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love the idea. I mean, I the street sweeper that comes down our street doesn't really bother me, but I do always hear it. I love the idea that the, you'd have a silent street sweeper. Just go, go, go down your street in the middle of the night and everyone knows there. You wake uh, up, it's like Christmas. Yeah, Everything's clean cleaning streets. Uh, we love to hear from our supporters. So if you have some time, uh, not even that much time, just a couple minutes, we ask that you fill out our latest survey. Let us know of what about Daily Tech News Show is working for you and what isn't. It's really easy to do. Just visit dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. Super easy to remember. Dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. The trial of Apple versus Epic Games. We've been talking about it all year. Finally begins Monday, 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 May 3rd. Presided over by Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers of the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. <laughs> the case was brought by Epic uh, after it tried to offer an alternative way of paying for in-game purchases in Fortnite earlier this year. Apple removed the game from the App Store. The case will evaluate whether the Sherman Act's definition of a monopoly in the United States applies to an operating system's app store. Epic would like the right to offer its own app store on iOS, as well as also be able to offer alternative payment methods within its apps distributed through Apple's app store. If Epic were to win this case, that would let developers offer their own in-app payment systems and possibly force Apple to allow side-loaded apps or even alternative app stores. Now, in the case, here are some of the arguments to be on the lookout for. Apple's going to argue that competition is and should be among devices, not within the OS. And Apple's going to argue that the app store is an integral part of its operating system and that changing that would make the device worse, which is not the aim of antitrust law, and that making it offer alternate app stores would be like forcing it to sell iPhones with chips other than its own A-series or something like that. Epic's going to point to the Mac, which has an app store, but also allows for other ways of buying and selling software and say, why is it so integral on the phone and not integral on your laptop? Apple's going to point to game consoles like the PlayStation and the Xbox, which have a 30% commission and don't offer alternate stores, and say that's the industry standard. We're just doing what they do. Apple will also use browsers as a defense, saying there's an alternate way to implement software outside of the App Store if you want. Just use a web app. Microsoft's doing it for its game streaming service. So is Amazon. We're going to get an all-star witness cast, too. This is this is Microsoft antitrust suit level witness. We're going to get Epic co-founder CEO Tim Sweeney. We're going to get Apple CEO Tim Cook. We're going to get all the senior executives from both companies. And we're going to get a, a nice uh, round of third-party witnesses, including Microsoft's VP of Xbox Business Development, to speak about the game console part of this. And Lori Wright, or I'm sure her name's Lori Wright. And NVIDIA's director of product management, Ashish Patel, is going to talk about the streaming service aspect of this. The ultimate decision of this case will set a precedent for how digital marketplaces are treated by the law. This trial is expected to take three weeks, but keep in mind, whatever the decision, it will likely be appealed, no matter who wins. So it's not going to be solved in this case, but this case will set the tone for any of those appeals. This is probably going to go all the way to the Supreme Court. But if you want to follow this version of the trial closely, Protocol's Nick Stat, Ben Brody, and David Pierce wrote up an excellent overview at protocol.com, and we'll have a link to that in our show notes at dailytechnewsshow.com. Yeah, this is definitely a gigantic battle that's about to take place. And uh, yeah, and I'm wondering, you know, like sometimes you see like other companies start at sending money on the back end because they, you know, where does Google fall in this? You know, are they helping Apple <laughs> with this or on the, on the other right, side? Right, because Epic's suing Google too. We haven't seen that case come to court yet. 
Yeah, so are they pooling and like, you know, we got to defend this because they're the both dominant platforms. And so we got to protect, we got to protect this house. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I kind of hope something falls in the middle because I do believe that you got the platform, you're number one, you know, nobody should be telling you how your platform works. But at the same time, you should not be able to use your platform to beat people over the head and, you know, and, and ruin their businesses to con continue to further yours. So I'm hoping it falls in somewhere in the middle, but I'm just wondering how Apple can lose this. If my prediction is, I don't know how Apple can lose this. You know, the Mac app store is an interesting angle uh, because, you know, the Mac didn't used to have an app store. Now it does. Uh, but Epic has a pretty good point of like, well, hold on. Why is the iOS version of, you know, a, a store that Apple provides, this thing that cannot be tampered with or else all of a sudden iPhones don't work so well, but the Mac store is, you know, companies are encouraged to have Mac apps. Or yeah, you go to their website or you download something, you know, some other way. But uh, I I don't know, I, I I think you're right, Tom. I think we'll, we will not get a concrete answer anytime soon, but uh, it will be a real showdown for sure. Yeah, Apple Apple is favored to win this. Uh, if if you talk to to the legal folks, not the odds makers, <laughs> to the legal folks, uh, uh, they they feel like Apple has the stronger case. Personally, I I think it's a little too far that Apple says you can't even tell people to link to a browser version where you can pay for something. I, I think that's ridiculous and it's a bad user experience. But I don't know that the law needs to force that to happen. Mm. Well, Microsoft kind of had that same argument too with IE back in the day, right? It's like it's an integral part of our mm -hmm. operating system. And it did. that didn't work. So yeah. that they're gonna have to probably do a little bit better than yep. that portion of it. All right. How's the power outage going there, Chris? I'm still in You're the still dark. here. I'm impressed. I, I'm, I'm watching the clock on the battery. <laughs> are you good to read this next one? The, all my screens are off. They're, they're not okay. on the battery. So. Ah, that's, I got yes. you. I got you covered. Uh, London City Airport, LCY, so not Heathrow, not Gatwick, uh, says it is the first major international airport to fully control air traffic using a digital tower. The 50-meter mast has 16 high-def cameras that give it a 360-degree view of the airfield. There are also two pan-tilt zoom cameras above that that mimic the functions of binoculars so they can swivel around and focus in on stuff. Video with overlaid call signs, aircraft speed, altitude, and weather readings are streamed to traffic controllers in Swanwick, Hampshire, 90 miles away. Uh, and they're surrounded by big screens that make it look like they're looking out windows. All flights on the summer schedule to LCY will be controlled using the new tower. System was previously trialed at two airports in Sweden, and they've also done trials at LCY with the old, the the current air traffic control system on site, happening at the same time, just so they can see if it all works the same way. And so far, the tests have been good. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think one, for uh, anybody who's like, wait a second, they're replacing, you know, smart people who do this for a living with, you know, it's all digital, but it's like it's all just information that's given to the people who are in charge that just don't need to be on site. You got enough cameras, what's different than you actually being in that tower? Yeah, now that was my first reaction. It's like, wait a minute, you know, who's gonna land the, you know, tell the person to <laughs> land the plane when, uh, you know, the pilot, you know, eats bad fish. But when I thought about it, I was like, and the part of the article kind of pointed out, it's, you know, the one port they portion they put in with the cameras that mimics the air traffic controllers using binoculars. I was like, oh, wait a minute. These guys can't see the planes and where they're going from the towers. Of course, they need systems and other things to be able to see the planes and direct them and do all this. So it's really not that much different, if if anything at all. So I, yeah. Yeah. And it's still air traffic controllers, still people. They're just in Swanwick instead of you know, near Canary Wharf in, in London. Uh, the, the big concerns are if connectivity were to fall out uh, and there there is still the old system available as a redundancy uh, that I imagine they would get up and running quickly uh, if, if they needed. Uh, but so far, uh, the, the Nats uh, office in Swanwick, uh, I think has a, a fairly robust and reliable connection and they haven't run into any problems in the trials. And they, they got to keep the the backup guy there, you know, just in case something happens. Who, you know, I would think. 
you know, and they're like, you're up. You know, I haven't done air traffic control in 30 years. <laughs> I thought this was a, a sweet gig where I'd never have to do anything. <laughs> was it supposed to be digital? What am I yeah. here for? Suddenly, suddenly this is a movie. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, uh, let's take off into another realm. Oh, let's. You might be planning a road trip to enjoy the great outdoors this year. Some people are, some people aren't. But if you've got that itch and you missed it last year and you might be going somewhere new and perhaps unfamiliar, let's check in with Chris Christensen for a tip. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. An upcoming episode of my travel podcast is going to be about a national park, the Big Bend National Park. And my guest there had a great recommendation that I want to pass along because you may be doing your vacation this year in a national park if you decide to leave the house, as a lot of people are. And that's the Just Ahead app. You can find it at justahead.com or in your smartphone's app store. But it's an app that has guides that are driving guides to national parks. The different portions of the guide are GPS located, and so you can find out what it is you're looking at and some of the history behind it. Check it out, justahead.com. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Oh, that's cool. So it, it's kind of like the uh, the guides in a museum that kind of know where you're at yeah. and, and play the right uh, stuff for you while you're while you're there. Really cool. I have been lost in Yosemite, and I would have liked this service. I have been to Big Bend National Park, uh, and uh, I, and I could have used that. I mean, I was there in like 1993, so it would have been possible. But uh, it's yeah. a cool place, and and lots of history. Lots of there's like a hot springs, and there's some uh, some uh, really ancient uh, cave etchings and 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 glyphs and stuff that that do bear some explanation. So that's cool. All right, let's check out the mailbag. This one comes from Alex. This is in response to our conversation yesterday about digital assistants getting names wrong and being able to have some customization, at least if you use Google's assistant. Alex says, my family has two names that all of the assistants get wrong. My wife's name is Christelle, which comes out as Crystal. So it seems everybody but French speakers have trouble with that name anyway. My daughter, Kimbri, comes out as Simbra. My Ram 3500 has weird pronunciation issues as well. More of let, letting users train would be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a feeling we're going to hear from more people who are like, oh, yeah, no, I have I have a friend, family member, or am that person who has the name that the yep. assistant can't get right. Uh, Josh wanted to share a discussion he had with his father, who's back home in India and retired last year as the director of IT for India's largest power utility, a job he got himself through self-learning. Josh says, I was waxing poetic about Apple's M1 chip with him and how it is a game changer and Intel needs to really pull something magical to even be relevant. And he asked me a very simple question. Can I get an M1 computer for about 20,000 to 25,000 rupees, which is approximately 300 to $350 US. When I said no, he calmly replied that Intel is not out of the race. This made me realize that all this hype for M1 is still for the Western markets, where a $999 computer is still not low, but reasonable. To my father's point, while the M1 will be a game changer until it can touch and impact all price brackets, it will be a niche product. India is just an example, but I'm sure you agree that a vast majority of the Asian and African market is also price sensitive. Smartphones became the juggernaut once they became a mainstay in these economies. So maybe there is still a place for another player to enter this market with the non-X86 chips to really cut into Intel's stronghold in the non-Western markets. What a great point. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and a point that I think also is still even relevant in some of the Western markets because not everybody can even afford $999. So it's, it's a yeah. worldwide point that his dad is making. Uh, my response to Josh uh, was what we're, what you want to look for is the company that's not Apple that comes out with an arm based chip that can do the power efficiency of the M one. That's when Intel really needs to start worrying. If somebody can come up with it with a more more flex, uh, a design like that that can go into those more affordable computers. 
Well, thanks to everybody who emails us every day. We can't respond to all of them on the show, but I promise that we do read every single one. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send your questions, comments, or anything in between. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Hey, today they include Dan Kolbeck, Chris Benito, and John and Becky Johnston. We also have a brand new boss, Beetle Percussion. Yep, we're looking at you, kid. Beetle <laughs> Percussion just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you to our new boss. Yes, be like Beetle Percussion on time and backing us on Patreon. Uh, thank you, Len Peralta, for being here to illustrate today's show. Len always draws something on our Friday shows. What have you drawn for us today, Len? Well, you know, Sarah mentioned earlier uh, about the uh, what I'm calling the vroomba, but it's the trombi, that it's very safe. Uh, and this is my take on the on the uh, vroomba or trombi. Uh, it's, it, you mentioned it's huge. Um, and I'm just worried about, uh, it does a great job cleaning, but does it also, um, you know, also take down some of the visitors who are coming to Helsinki as well? I'm <laughs> a little bit concerned about that. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure it's totally fine. I'm sure there are uh, safety specs, everything. Uh, but, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'll be a little bit worried seeing this thing come down the the aisle at me like three in the morning. I don't know. I'd be running after I'd be running away from it anyway. Um, it's going slow and it's, it's got sensors that it, if it sees an obstacle or a pedestrian, we said that it, it'll stop, but I understand the concern. I get yeah. It. Yeah. That's I, I, hopefully it's not going to T-bone anybody. So it, like, uh, like, uh, Sarah had said, uh, this image is, uh, actually, uh, right now at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, also at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. And I want to mention that this afternoon was very special because it was the first time that I went live on Twitch and shared this, uh, of creation with the world. Uh, so if you'd like to follow my new Twitch channel, which I'm thinking of doing before GDI every Friday, go to Len, per, uh, go to go search Len Peralta on Twitch and, uh, and you'll find me and follow me uh, for all the streams. Good stuff. As always, Len, also thanks to Chris Ashley, who weathered a power outage throughout the entire show and did not miss a beat. Chris, where can people keep up with your, the rest of your superhero type work? And when the power is on, you can always catch me. <laughs> At the SMR podcast, we try to record every week. Me and my homies, Rob Dunwood and Rod Simmons, you know, talking tech, talking a uh, little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, you might find out how to bar barbecue a brisket or you might find out how to drive a Tesla. Who knows what we're going to talk about, but it's a fun show. And you can always check me out on Twitter at Big Chris Ashley. Listen, Excellent. Going, going through Daily Tech News Show uh, with some kind of challenge like your power being out or a tree about to fall on you or, or something, that's a rite of passage. So round of applause, Chris Ashley, uh, my, my man. Yeah. What kind of natural disaster will we experience on Monday? Tune in to find out. In fact, we're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Every weekday, you all. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live and join us live if you can. We'll be back Monday with Nate Langson, who hopefully will not experience... Uh, I would this show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show was created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lang. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Social media producer, Shannon Morse. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, Zoe Brings Bacon, BioCow, Captain Kipper, and Jack Shid. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music provided by Martin Bell and Dan Luters. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Chris Ashley. Our guest on this week's show was Aaron Carson. Live art performed by Len Peralta. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>